Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I would be grateful for short and succinct questions and answers. Please, question one, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the community safety aspects of the licensing of smartphone booking systems for transport services. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. While there are potential benefits to the use of smartphone apps, it is essential that the legislation and enforcement it remains fit for purpose to ensure that people are kept safe. Uh, recent developments, including the evidence taken by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee in relation to the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill, have further highlighted the need for review. Uh, the Scottish Government expects every oper operator to work within the confines of the existing licensing regime and for all drivers and vehicles to be licensed. Anyone uh, acting as an unlicensed driver or operating out with the relevant booking office licence will be committing an offence and could be liable for prosecution by the Crown. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for, the, for his answer. And I understand that companies uh, such as the American-based Uber are currently applying for licences for such operations in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, with a possible financial loss to the tax and private hire tax that you trade and in turn local authorities via licence fees uh, of drivers and cars if these services are introduced in Scotland, as well as the safety aspects of having drivers and cars which will not be regulated and scrutinised in the same manner as traditional taxi services. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what the Scottish Government can do to, to ensure both the safety of passengers and also the protection of jobs in the current taxi trade? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, the member raises a, an important point, and as I've said, uh, from the government's perspective, we expect every operator to work within the confines of the existing uh, regime. Uh, along with the relevant stakeholders, uh, we are reviewing the existing legislation to ensure that it remains fit for purpose. Uh, we are aware of the concerns uh, around the growth of mobile phone apps, uh, such as those run by Uber. We recently held a, an informal meeting with representatives of the trade at Police Scotland, at local authorities uh, and relevant academics to discuss this particular issue and to also explore uh, what options could be taken. Uh, whilst the taxi and private hire uh, car provision is in the current, uh, in the current bill, it uh, does not specifically address the technological developments the member made reference to. The Civic Government Scotland Act 1982 already provides considerable scope for secondary legislation to address uh, such issues. And we have an ability to provide clarification around issues such as best practice in this area uh, for local authorities. So I can assure the member we are aware of this particular issue and some of the concerns around uh, the, uh, the use of these types of apps and organisations such as Uber. And we will be continuing to engage with stakeholders to look at what is the best approach uh, to take this forward within the uh, Civic Government Scotland Act 1982. Many thanks. Question two, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that more could be done to improve the legal rights of fathers in relation to parental custody disputes. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, we would not propose any change to the law in the area of residence or contact provisions at this time. Uh, the key principle in Scots law is that the welfare of the child is paramount. However, the Government is carrying out work in a number of relevant areas. For example, we have chaired a working group on child welfare reporters and are working to refresh the parenting agreement for Scotland which can help separating parents agree on future arrangements for their children. Thank you. John Mason. I mean, I thank the Minister for his reply. I wonder if he would accept that uh, when one parent has care and does not comply with a contact order, it is often too expensive for the non-resident parent to return to court. Minister. Well, well, certainly what we try and do, and unlike um, uh, the administration south of the border, uh, Mr Mason will appreciate, we uh, maintain that um, legal aid is, uh, is open to use for family cases. So we obviously try and ensure that people have access to law to protect their interests. Clearly there are groups that can, that can help individuals who are needing advice about what their options are in terms of seeking uh, contact with their children. So we'd certainly be happy to meet with Mr Mason if, if he would find it helpful to explain what more we can do to help. Many thanks. Question three, Mary Fee. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with trade unions regarding employment-related issues in the justice sector. Cabinet Secretary Michael Maths. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring positive engagement with trade unions across the range of sectors. This includes the justice sector. 
The Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and I uh, meet on a regular basis with the trade, union representing, uh, trade unions representing police staff and the fire brigade. In addition, I have also met with unions representing prison officers and prison governors to discuss matters of concern to them and to their members. As members will be aware, employment-related issues for staff are a matter for the relevant organisation in discussion with their respective union. Uh, the Scottish Government does not engage directly in these negotiations. Thank you. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? I recently met with Community Trade Union, who raised specific concerns about issues faced by private sector employees delivering justice and custodial services. And I am sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that these staff play a key role on behalf of the Scottish public. It is a difficult job, and while the environment is similar to those who work in the public sector, the mechanism available to staff in the private sector can often be different. Community have raised with me concerns that staffing numbers may be having on the personal safety and security of their members. Would the Minister agree to meet with representatives of community to hear firsthand about the excellent job they do and the issues they face on a daily basis? Well, I'm aware of the excellent job uh, these members of staff do within uh, our private prison estate and also within the uh, uh, custody transfer uh, services which are provided by uh, private contractors as well. I'm, I'm always uh, open to engaging with uh, trade union uh, representatives and I would also expect uh, employer uh, organisations to engage purposely and meaningfully with their uh, trade union uh, representations. Uh, can I also say if uh, the community union have uh, specific concerns about uh, some of these matters which are contracts which are managed through the uh, Scottish Prison Service, I would also expect the trade union to engage directly with uh, the SPA to raise concerns about the operation of any of these particular uh, contracts. So I'm always open to engaging with uh, trade union representatives and if they wish to make representations to me, um, I'd be more than happy to uh, consider that. Thank you very much. Um, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise whether there has been any recent dialogue between the Scottish Government and representatives of rank and file police officers? And if so, what's been discussed? Uh, I meet on a regular basis with the staff association representing uh, police officers uh, to discuss a range of uh, different matters that affect their members. And I last met with the uh, Scottish Police Federation on the 17th of February and with the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents on the 12th of March. Uh, police officers' terms and conditions um, are uh, one of the issues that were discussed, uh, and there are uh, issues which have been taken forward by the Police Negotiation uh, Board. The member will also be aware, uh, and I am very proud of the fact that, unlike the Westminster Government, we have retained independent national collective bargaining for police officers in Scotland. I also met with the Prison Officers Association on the 18th of December, uh, which was an introductory meeting to discuss a range of issues uh, that affect our prison officers uh, within the SPS estate. Many thanks. And briefly, John Penland. Does the Minister share my disgust at the disgraceful way Scottish Government contractors, G4S, have treated their guards, with some even being handed redundancy notices while handcuffed to prisoners? Will he review this contract? Absolutely. Well, the member will be aware that this was a contract that was set up by the last government uh, in terms of privatising this particular aspect of uh, services which we have uh, inherited. Uh, I understand that the SPS who are engaged with G4S on this particular matter are in dialogue with them over how they have been handling some of these issues. But the member will recognise that some of the difficulties with this particular contract is the responsibility of his own party colleagues. Many thanks. Question four, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made in tackling new psychoactive substances. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, firstly, can I thank Graeme Day for his continued interest in this issue and for the work he has done locally to help tackle these substances. I, I set a range of activities being led and funded by this Government in my statement to the Chamber on the 26th of February. I am pleased to confirm that progress is being made on all fronts, including the commissioning of research, developing an agreed definition of NPS, uh, developing the detail of a centre for excellence in forensics and guidance for trading standards and local authorities. Officials are in close contact with the Home Office in respect of work required to bring these substances under legal control and we will look to engage with our counterparts on this issue as soon as possible following the Westminster election. Uh, I have also written to the leaders of each group in this chamber to invite them to nominate a colleague from each party to participate in a ministerial cross-party group uh, to build on the encouraging political consensus uh, on, in Scotland on tackling these dangerous substances. 
very much, Graham Day. I thank the Minister for that response. I'm sure the Minister will join me in welcoming the recent action taken by the UK Government in introducing a 12-month ban on five different compounds, at least one of which I understand features in up to 60 per cent of the NPS trafficked in Scotland, whilst the ACMD decide whether permanent control measures should be put in place. But I wonder how, in practice, the Scottish Government, working with partners such as Police Scotland, will raise awareness of the penalties anyone caught making, supplying or importing these drugs now face, and indeed how they will enforce the ban. Minister. Um, well, I certainly welcome the temporary banning order on these uh, substances. Uh, Graeme Day is quite right. These substances are now controlled under the terms of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. And if any intelligence is uh, received that they are being sold, then the police will deal with them as, though they, as they would with any other controlled drug. Police Scotland have hand-delivered letters to premises potentially selling these substances. This letter makes owners aware of the banning order, that the conviction of selling these substances could lead up to, to up to 14 years in prison and an unlimited fine. Thank you very much. Margaret Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Minister um, aware that there are an estimated 14 of these head shops in Edinburgh selling NPS? However, the scale of the problem in other parts of the country is less clear. Can he confirm the number of head shops across the country? And if not, um, what action is being taken to collect this data and to measure the sale of these substances in an effort to properly assess the full extent of the problem and to establish a, statutory, uh, a strategy for dealing with this increasingly worrying problem? Minister. Well, I certainly, certainly agree with Margaret Mitchell that we, we face a, a big challenge in, in understanding the full extent of, of NPS use in Scotland, and clearly that's one of the, the key tasks that uh, we will hopefully take forward in the uh, Ministerial Cross-Party Group in terms of investigating what, what the, the statistics show. Uh, she's quite right to highlight the number of head shops. Um, indications are, are varied um, in terms of the numbers. I've heard estimates over 40 in Scotland as a whole, uh, although that may not capture all activity of selling NPS, sometimes through shops which aren't necessarily identified as head shops, but maybe uh, for another purpose, but also selling NPS to, to customers. So we will try and get a, a clearer picture on the scale of the problem at a national level, and certainly give that assurance to, to Margaret Mitchell. I will keep her informed of or progress in that area. Okay, and briefly, Nigel Don. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The uh, Minister will be aware that I have received a petition from several thousand people in Forfa who are very concerned that there should not be another head shop in, in Forfa. Um, I'm wondering whether the Minister would agree to meet with me so that I can talk through these issues with him and see what we can do, please. Minister. Certainly, I, I'm very happy to meet with uh, Nigel Dawn to discuss this issue. We are very supportive of the excellent efforts to deal with MPS in the, the members' local area and have previously commended uh, authorities in Angus for their work and would be definitely happy, happy to, to arrange a meeting to discuss the petition and the concerns of the local community. Thank you. Question five, Animal Goldie. To um, ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to reduce reconviction rates among offenders given drug treatment and testing orders. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, drug treatment and testing orders, or DTTOs, uh, are a high tariff disposal aimed at individuals with entrenched drug misuse problems who off offend as a result of their addiction and would otherwise face a custodial sentence. The Scottish Government recognises that DTTOs have the highest reconviction rate compared to other court disposals. Over the past decade, there has, however, been consistent progress in reducing these figures. Since 2002 3, uh, the overall reconviction rate has fallen by nearly 18% from 75 uh, to 62 out of 100 per, per 100. The Scottish Government will continue to work with delivery partners to ensure that DTTOs are, are targeted at the most suitable offenders who can best benefit from the intensive demands of that regime. The uh, Minister will be aware Hannibal. that recently published figures confirm that almost two-thirds of such offenders re-offended within a year, and that's an upwards trend. Now, that is serving neither justice nor the offender. Does the Minister agree that this is profoundly unsatisfactory, and is he prepared to instruct a review of how such offenders can be given more effective disposals on conviction? Minister. Well, I, I just outlined in my original answer the, the first figure that uh, Annabel Coley quoted is in line with what I, what I said in terms of almost two-thirds, but there has, as I indicated, been a reduction since 2002 or 2003. Uh, but, however, t taking the, the more substantive point that Annabel Goldie raises, we do keep these matters under review. There has been a, a recent evaluation, uh, for, certainly or not 
over the period 2002 to 2004 found that DTTOs have a positive and dramatic impact on drug use and offending, which was sustained for at least six months after the end of an order. We're also looking at the importance of the uh, DTTO2 uh, variant, which is for perhaps less, uh, for mainly impacting on women and, and children. It seems to have had some success in, in terms of dealing with reoffending behaviour there. So I'm happy to, to uh, deal with the, the matter in correspondence with Annabel Goldie. If there's anything specific she's looking for in terms of detail to help her inform her work. Thank you. Question six, in the name of Gavin Brown, has been withdrawn for understandable reasons. Question seven, Adam Ingram. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government how it assists offenders in tackling drug abuse problems. Sir, Paul Wheelhouse. Um, all offenders receive a health care assessment at the reception point in prison. Uh, the assessment includes questions on substance misuse. Those identified as having a drug issue and test positive for drugs are offered a continuation of any community-based opiate replacement therapy or are prescribed treatment. Prisoners are offered the opportunity to engage with addiction services while in prison where they can assess harm reduction information, brief interventions for drug misuse and assessment by an addictions caseworker, including onward referral on release. The substance misuse work stream of the National Prisoner Healthcare Network is currently finalising reports with recommendations to ensure a consistent approach in the management of substance misuse in the prisoner population based on the recovery-oriented system of care model, and the report is due to be published in September this year. Many thanks. Adam Ingram. Uh, thank you for that reply, uh, Minister. Um, I, I was going to ask a supplementary on drug treatment and testing orders, but Annabelle Goldie pre-empted me. Uh, maybe a question of great minds think alike, but, uh, or maybe not. But um, could, I, could I ask uh, the fact that DTTOs appear to be having some impact on uh, reducing reconviction rates, how are you going to build on that? Uh, are there other um, factors or, or measures that you can bring into play to help reduce reconviction? Absolutely. Um, Adam Ingram raises an important point. There is a, a process evaluation published in July 2010 that suggested that DTTOs too are effective, uh, partic particularly effective in targeting women offenders, as I said in response to Annabel Goldie. And a further internal evaluation of the pilot scheme in late 2014 found that the service continues to achieve its aims of um, reaching lower tariff offenders and effectively targeting women and young people who are more likely uh, to complete a DTTO2 than a full DTTO, uh, and that con uh, continues to enjoy uh, overwhelmingly positive support from sentencers and uh, is associated with reductions in recidivism. So there clearly are uh, other measures outside of the, the conventional DTTO, which is perhaps more onerous for some people to, to comply with, but we'll continue to keep under review uh, the range of measures we have to help reduce reoffending, and that's something the Cabinet Secretary is particularly keen to, to tackle. Thank you. Question 8, Paul Martin. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps have been taken to tackle antisocial behaviour in Glasgow province. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to tackling antisocial behaviour to improve the lives of all our communities. I am pleased to inform that the, uh, the member that the multi agency tasking and coordinating process developed by partners, including Police Scotland, Community Safety Glasgow, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and British Transport Police, has seen combined year on year reductions in antisocial behaviour across the province area as a whole. I believe that partnership working is central to tackling antisocial behaviour in robust and meaningful ways. And, for example, I'm aware that the collaborative work between Police Scotland, Housing Associations and Community Safety Glasgow has targeted the issues surrounding gang fighting occurring between rival groups in the traditional schemes, given these behaviours have been a blight on the area for decades. Uh, the importance of this work cannot be underestimated and we must continue to drive it forward. That is why I'm pleased to be able to confirm uh, that the multi-agency tasking and coordinating process is being reviewed to bring on board uh, more partner agencies and to ensure that the good work which has been achieved to date uh, can be sustained and further built upon in the longer term. Paul Martin. Uh, President Officer, can I recognise some of the positive, a great deal of positive work has been done in tackling gang fighting in Glasgow and can I say that despite some of the publicity in respect to Easter House, East was an area was very positive uh, things going on in that constituency, in that part of my constituency. But can I say it still considers to be the case that antisocial behaviour has been underreported? Uh, and I think a lot of that refers to the fact that it's still a cost associated with calling the 101 service. Uh, does the Minister agree with me that there should be no cost to anyone, no matter which mobile operator uh, they deal with, when they make a call to the 101 service? And will the government fund that to ensure that it is a free service? Minister. 
I, I certainly welcome uh, Mr Martin's positive comments and I appreciate his uh, constructive tone in terms of his, his question. The closure of, um, it's worth pointing out in terms of the, the, the 101 uh, calls issue that Mr Martin raises that there is a fixed cost indeed of 15 pence, but that is irrespective of the length of the call, um, the time of the day the call is made or whether the call is made from a landline phone or, or indeed a mobile. Uh, and Police Scotland's website states the reason for charge being levied in calls is due to there always having been a cost associated with non-emergency calls. Having said that, I appreciate the point he's making. Clearly, we obviously try to make sure that, that um, uh, local communities have as much access to, as possible to report incidents. And clearly, if there's an, a, a situation where a, a crime is in progress or indeed uh, there's a, a fear for part, someone's safety, I would certainly encourage them to phone uh, 999. Uh, but uh, we'll certainly uh, take on board Mr Martin's points in uh, our negotiations with uh, Briefly, Mr. Bruce Crawford. That's the Scottish Government what progress it is making regarding its consultation on the future of the custodial estate for women. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mass. Uh, throughout March, a series of public consultation workshops were held in the eight community justice authority areas across Scotland. In addition, separate events were held with SPS staff and women who are currently in custody. The views of the families of women in custody have also been taken into account. My officials are now looking at best practice in other jurisdictions and will be hosting an international symposium for academics and expert practitioners at the end of May. This will ensure that we learn from innovation across the world as we develop a new approach to custody for women. However, whilst we are committed to providing high quality custodial facilities for women, custody must be seen as part of the sentencing options as a last resort. Our wider aspiration is to reduce the use of custody as a disposal, with as many women as possible being supported in the community. Briefly, Bruce Crawford. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that in regard to the future of Cottonville Prison that we need to see emerging in future a facility that is highly regarded as centre of excellence as part of the custodial estate for women, utilising the expertise and the highly trained staff who currently work at the prison? Prime Minister. Uh, the member raises a good point and the, the use of Compton Vale site is being considered as part of the overall plans to reshape our female custodial facilities across Scotland and any facility which is uh, to be based at Compton Vale would have to be a new fit for purpose facility and not a continued use of the existing uh, facilities. However, developing a new custodial environment is only part of our overall uh, policy to improve the outcomes for women offenders, and we'll be working to ensure that custody is used as infrequently as possible and is seen as a sentence of last resort. Many thanks. And we now move to questions two uh, on rural affairs, food and the environment. Question one has not been lodged, and a less than satisfactory answer uh, explanation has been given in the name of Drew Smith. Question two, Margaret Mitchell. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the review of waste spreading, including sewage sludge. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockwood. The review of waste spreading is underway. The Scottish Government, in partnership with SEPA, our Environment Agency, and Scottish Water, has already held a number of meetings with stakeholders to better understand the key issues regarding the spreading of sewage sludge on land. In particular, my officials have met with representatives of communities within the members' constituency to hear their concerns. We want to make sure that where sewage sludge is stored or spread to land, it is done safely and does not cause nuisance or inconvenience to the general public. And as part of the review, we are looking closely at the legislation, processes and guidance underpinning the practice, and further meetings with key interests will take place in the coming weeks. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, given the Cabinet Secretary has met with constituents in my area, he will be aware of the problems associated with the spreading of sewage sludge in the Falker area, in particular Shield Hall, Slamanan, Avonbridge in California, which has created intolerable living conditions for residents as a, and has affected their health, including those suffering with respiratory ailments. It has also resulted in the cancelling of a primary school sports day due to the, the stench making children physically sick in the play playground. Given this unacceptable situation has persisted for several years now, is the cabinet, what's the Cabinet Secretary doing to address these specific problems now? Well, Margaret Mitchell conveys some of the concerns expressed by some communities in relation to this issue. And of course, I was listening closely, and that's why I gave instructions for the review to begin. And I can assure Margaret Mitchell uh, and other members of the chamber that the issues raised will be taken into account by the review and treated seriously. I hope to have a report back from the review group around summer of this year. Many thanks. Uh, Claudia Beamish. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the review and a meeting with um, Scottish Government officials next week along with concerned constituents. Um, the inconsistencies in treatment of sewage waste, as explained to me by SEPA, are indeed unacceptable. Some waste is dried only, while some is also treated depending on availability of facilities. In announcing the review, the Cabinet Secretary stated, I'm confident that this review will enable us to strike the right balance between the benefits of using sewage sludge and the controls that protect both the public and the wider environmental interests. Can the Cabinet Secretary now clarify whether the review will consider the appropriateness of spreading human sewage uh, at all on land, and can he also make available for members of the public and members of this chamber the terms of reference of the review? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would have to remind the Chamber we are talking about an activity that's been carried out safely for many years in Scotland. However, there are issues, as members are quite rightly raising, and that's the purpose of the review, is to, to look at those specific issues and others that anyone wants to bring to our attention. However, there is a remit in place, and I'm happy to write to both the members who've raised this subject today or others who may afterwards. Uh, with the remit of the review, I'll reiterate it right now, it'll take quite a while, and also clearly give you the opportunity to feed into the review directly, and it'd be helpful to have your comments and experiences in relation to your constituents. Thank you. Angus MacDonald, briefly, please. Thank you, President Officer. The, the review into the spreading of sewage sludge is welcome. However, could I urge the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government to consider increasing capacity for the incineration of sewage pellets, as is the norm in other Northern European countries, which would go some way towards helping residents who suffer regularly from a stench from sewage sludge, eh, which is applied to farmland in Scotland and in the Upper Braes area of my constituency. Captain. Well, as Angus MacDonald will be aware, there are already regulations, of course, in place, and there is a waste hierarchy. So incineration of sludge can be a part of energy recovery, uh, with, uh, as long as it's appropriate equipped licensed facilities. However, there is a hierarchy, and it's got a certain place within that pecking order. Therefore, there are other options that are perhaps preferred for dealing with sludge. But incineration is certainly one option, and it is available at the moment. So I just want to reassure the member that is the case. Thanks. Question three, Lewis MacDonald. What progress is being made in rolling out access to local authority flooding data sets that have been developed through the use of LiDAR technology? Mr. Aileen MacLeod. Uh, LiDAR technology provides topographical information, which is a viable tool in flood modelling across large areas. Two phases of data collection have been undertaken since 2010, targeting specific areas identified as vulnerable to flooding. This has been a multi-agency project and as part of their contribution, SEPA has been in direct contact with individual local authorities to inform them as to its availability and relevant licensing requirements. Okay, Lewis MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. Does she agree that the high level of detail provided by LiDAR datasets is the best defence against flooding risk? as long as councils have the right tools to use this data in full. If so, will the government do all it can to ensure that councils have the right tools, and will she support collaborative procurement of the best available software in order to deliver on agreed planning policy objectives in this field? Minister. Um, can I thank um, Louis MacDonald for his uh, supplementary? I mean, we are looking to develop an appropriate mechanism to allow wider sharing of the data amongst agencies which is being picked up as part of the open data initiative and in the meantime we are providing uh, wider access to public bodies on a case-by-case -case, um, basis and to receive the data each public sector organization must obviously sign a licensing uh, agreeing to the terms and conditions of its use in terms of the well, the data will be made available more widely. The procurement exercise for these projects recognise the potential wider value this data has across the public sector and allows wider use that is in the public goods. And public authorities in flood risk management already have access uh, to the information and are able to use it more widely within the terms of the licence. And we're looking at being able to develop practical ways in which the data can be made more widely available. Thank you very much. Question four, Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government who is responsible for ensuring the water quality in relation to new building developments. Minister. Uh, Scottish Water is responsible for ensuring that the quality of drinking water supplied to the boundary of properties is wholesome as defined by the Public Water Supply Scotland Regulations 2014. This duty is regulated by the Drinking Water Quality Regulator for Scotland. The developer is responsible for ensuring infrastructure on a new development is of a satisfactory standard to ensure that water quality is maintained and to enable adoption by Scottish Water. 
Thank you. Alec Rowley. Thank the Minister for, for the answer. And this is an issue which I have highlighted to the Minister in terms of my own constituency in New Farm Real Estate. Um, the problem that residents in this estate are facing appear to run across a number of government departments with Scottish Water sitting within the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure. Then we have planning sitting within the Cabinet Question, Secretary Mr. for Rowley. Social Justice. My issue is that my constituents have been let down by the failure within the system to ensure developers are putting the proper water and sewage infrastructure in place. And will the Minister agree to meet with me and to discuss that and possibly look at the fact that it runs across three different departments? and how best we can take that forward. Minister. Uh, thank you, Sitting Officer. I mean, yes, I would agree the situation at New Farm Vale uh, is completely unacceptable. And the government is working with Scottish Water to understand the full scale of this problem. It is important that solutions are found as malfunctioning sewage systems have, as you will agree, significant public health implications. Ideally, this infrastructure should be vested in Scottish Water. However, we need to understand the remedial costs for each case and to understand how these can be funded. I understand that Mr Rowley is due to meet with Scottish Water to discuss what options are available in the case of New Farm Vale. I have also asked that the Government and Scottish Water work together to understand whether there are any further measures that can be implemented to minimise the likelihood of such problems occurring in the future. But I would be more than happy to meet with Alex Rowley to discuss this further. Thank you very much. Question 5, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what, what, it, what it is doing in this year of food and drink to encourage local authorities and NHS boards to promote Scottish food. <coughs> Secretary. The Scottish Government is working with local authority caterers association and also Education Scotland to deliver a year of food and drink activities across schools in Scotland. This includes, for instance, the development of theme days and also a food calendar for school meals. In addition, a school's local providence handbook is being developed to identify and promote local school meal suppliers. We are also in discussion with the NHS on what further steps it can take to further raise the profile of Scottish food, building on the good progress it is already making to source local healthy produce. For example, the NHS is working closely with the Soil Association to seek the Food for Life Catering Mark Award, which signals a commitment to local food and providence. Thank you. Mike McKenzie. Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he believe, though, that there is even greater scope for local authorities and NHS boards to lead by example and, whenever possible, procure local food for their own use, making sure there are no irrational barriers to the purchase of local produce in their procurement processes? And is he aware of any local authorities or health boards who are following good practice in this regard and which could be used as an example for others to follow? <coughs> There are many local authorities that have been setting good standards of practice, such as in Ayrshire and Tayside and elsewhere, and many others are now upping their game. So I do believe there's still lots of scope for improved sourcing of local produce in the public sector, particularly local authorities, the NHS and elsewhere. But I also believe that good progress has been made, and this issue is much higher up the agenda than ever before. So I think that over the coming months and years, we will continue to make good progress and as part of becoming a good food nation, we have to ensure that people in our hospitals, our care homes, our prisons, our schools, of course, as mentioned, and elsewhere, are able to uh, access Scotland's fantastic larder. Thank you. Malcolm Chisholm. I'm sure we're all agreed that it would be in the interest of the health of uh, many people in Scotland if we had a much higher percentage of fresh local food uh, used in schools and hospitals. Will the uh, government undertake in partnership with Food Standards uh, Scotland to, to promote uh, actively and vigorously uh, appropriate public sector uh, procurement practices to further this objective? Well, as I indicated in my answer, there are a number of public agencies already involved in taking this agenda forward with their, 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 their members, such as the uh, local government associations and Education Scotland uh, and, and so on. The new food standards body, of course, has a slightly extended remit compared to the old body and will hopefully be taking more of an interest in these kinds of issues. So I will ensure they are aware of the, the member's interest. And uh, I think all of Scotland's public sector and all our agencies have to rally around the cause. Thank you. Briefly, Christian Allard. 
Thank you, President Officer. Will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that we will be funding for, from Aberdeenshire Council and the Scottish Seafood Partnership in order that there will be a seafood cooking facility at this year's test of Grampian, like there has been in previous years? Well, I have uh, attended, I think, virtually every taste of Grampian since I was uh, appointed Minister and they are fantastic showcases for local produce in the northeast of Scotland. And I recall last year attending the seafood uh, tent, which was a complete sellout. And I remember some of the local companies had to send for fresh stock by noon because they were so popular. Uh, so it's certainly an asset to the Taste of Grampian, uh, the seafood uh, tent. And they have, of course, received a grant from Events Scotland this year to help celebrate the Year of Food and Drink. So uh, I, I do hope that uh, the showcasing of seafood is part of their plans, and I'm sure it will be. Uh, and I'll double check that that's what it's being used for. Thanks. Question six, Colin Keane. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the Rural Affairs Directorate is helping farms and other rural, rural businesses take advantage of the opportunities arising from the tourism industry. Capsec. The Scottish Government and its agencies continue to work with the rural businesses to recognise and build on the potential growth opportunities afforded by tourism. And over £28 million was distributed through our last rural development programme to a range of tourism-related businesses to support the rural economy. And our new programme will build on that success and continue to make funding and support available for tourism-related actions uh, across uh, rural Scotland involving many of our local businesses. Colin Keir. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? Will he agree with me that local authorities should do their best to help rural businesses and farms by being less obstructive and cut a bit of red tape, unlike the City of Edinburgh Council, who have refused a simple request from the, the owner of Craigie's Farm outside Queen's Ferry in my constituency to have roadside signs erected in order to attract the ever-growing number of tourists and locals who wish to use the new services? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in terms of uh, Craigie's, just outside Edinburgh, the farm shop uh, and restaurant uh, is a fantastic location. I've been there uh, at least two or three times over the last few years. Uh, and John Sinclair, the chap who runs that, uh, does a lot to support local food. So I do feel that the local authority, like the rest of the public sector, should support uh, his efforts. And in terms of boosting the tourism potential of that location, uh, because these, these locations do play a crucial role in local food tourism. Uh, yes, sometimes we are too heavy-handed in terms of the brown tourism signs, and perhaps a local authority could do what they can to support his efforts to make an even bigger contribution to local tourism. Many thanks. Uh, question 7, in the name of Neil Finlay, has been withdrawn, and a satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question 8, in the name of Rhoda Grant, was not lodged, and a less than satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question 9, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the potato industry. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government provides scientific and technical advice to the industry and conducts diagnostic surveillance and scientific research on a number of plant health related issues. At the present time, we fund around £4 million per year on potato-related scientific research in Scotland. We also facilitate worldwide trade in seed potatoes by hosting inward missions with the Potato Council to improve contact with foreign officials, with the aim, of course, of influencing import conditions in the visitors' countries. This does demonstrate to potential export markets the quality benefits of Scotland's high health status and worldwide reputation as a producer of quality seed. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The potato industry is worth a total of £4.7 billion to the UK economy, with seed exports alone contributing £209 million to the Scottish economy and retail sales valued at £117 million. Average yields have increased by 18% in the last 20 years. What further action can the Scottish Government take to ensure that the humble potato is promoted across Scottish Government policy documents to highlight this inexpensive source of nutrition? Cabinet Secretary. There is a lot of work undergoing at the moment, and the member quite rightly highlights the important role that our tatty sector plays in terms of Scottish agriculture and our food sector, and is a particularly valuable sector to Scotland, worth about £170 million a year. And of course, Scotland is a world leader, as I'm sure many members are aware of producing uh, seed potatoes. 
Uh, there's a lot of thought going on just now to promote more than ever before the health benefits of potatoes, and I think there's cross-party support for that. And there's recently been events held in the Chamber, and the Scottish Government certainly supports that. And I know the National Farmers Union uh, has also encouraged the Potato Council to use a much higher proportion of the statutory levies to fund promotional work highlighting the health benefits of potatoes. And, of course, that's perhaps one way we can address the decline in consumption that has been experienced in recent years because our tatties are fantastic quality in Scotland, they're very tasty and they're good for you as well. Many thanks. Question 10, Liz Smith. The Scottish Government whether it will seek an extension to the deadline for the registration of single application forms for rural payments and services. Secretary. Well, I'm sure the member will be pleased to know that I announced on Wednesday the 15th of April that Scotland will extend the application period for farmers and crofters to submit their single application form by a month, giving a new deadline of June the 15th, uh, 2015, uh, this year. Uh, I, th I thank the Cabinet Secretary and I'm sure it is a huge relief to the whole rural sector that the deadline has now been extended because it's been very clear indeed from the uh, printed uh, farming press that farmers remain very angry that their concerns which were expressed as early as December last year were not addressed when the problem first arose. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give that lessons have been learnt from this regrettable situation which has actually cost £130 million of taxpayers' money and can he provide a categorical assurance that it will not have an adverse impact on the timing of farm payments next December or delay the SRDP application process? Uh, firstly, the investment that the member refers to is an investment, is an investment in the new common agricultural policy which has to be delivered over the next five years and not simply uh, as a result of some of the difficulties that we have encountered over the last few weeks, which I readily accept have caused enormous frustration for some farmers and some agents in Scotland. I think the Chamber will recognise that the UCAP is very complex and this is a transition year and the first few weeks uh, we're always going to be challenging and we have to learn lessons from those challenges. I, I very much accept that. However, we are making progress and many uh, farmers are determined to submit their applications online. I would also remind the Chamber, of course, that since day one, farmers and agents have been able to submit using paper as well, and many have done so. So we're working flat out to fix some of the IT issues because even the agents I've been speaking to and the farmers, as I said before, who are frustrated, I, I very well understand, by some of these flaws in the, the computer system, they are determined that online is the way forward. And, of course, that brings advantages because errors in the application forms themselves can be fixed straight away as opposed to having enormous delays, which can sometimes happen from paper submissions. So we're working flat out on this. In terms of the impact on the timetable for actual payments, which are normally December under the old policy and we hope to try and continue under the new policy. I will keep the industry up to date, but we're doing our best to stay on schedule. But clearly, as the months go by, I will keep the Chamber and the industry up to date in terms of the payment schedule. Many thanks. And we now have to move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12869 in the name of...